Hello and welcome to Sigma Psi's Distinguished Lectureship Series. I'm Katie Burke, Digital Features Editor at American Scientist, and I'm here today with George Weiblin, a plant biologist at the University of Minnesota. George, thanks for joining us. It's good to be here, Katie. Thanks for having me on your program. Sure. So before we start, I'd like to make sure viewers watching us live uh, note that you can submit questions to ask George um, through the chat window on this Adobe Connect website, or you can also ask them through Twitter using the hashtag AmSciTalks. That's A-M-S-C-I-T-A-L-K-S, AmSciTalks. And Sigma Psi members can also dis discuss this topic afterward by logging on to the Sigma Psi community page. Okay, one of George's research areas, the plant, one of George's research areas, the plant biology, genetics, and crop science of cannabis. There are two varieties of the species cannabis sativa. One is marijuana and the other one is industrial hemp. George, without getting into the genetics yet, what are the similarities and differences between marijuana and industrial hemp? Well, as you said, they're both members of the same species, uh, but they differ in the uh, qualities that we as humans uh, find of economic interest. So, uh, in fact, there are many, many hundreds or potentially thousands of different varieties or cultivars, cultivated forms of plant cannabis, but they generally fall uh, into a, a small number of, of categories. And you can, you can separate the hemp uh, from the marijuana varieties on the basis of their uh, drug content and uh, their um, fiber and seed quality as well. This hemp is primarily associated with the fiber and the seed production, whereas marijuana with, with uh, drug production. Mm -hmm. And so what is industrial hemp used for? It's, um, it's, and what are, what, among those uses, what are the most profitable uh, of, and uses of interest in the hemp market right now? Well, it's a really interesting uh, crop in that it supports such a uh, diverse range of uses. So um, the stems of the plant are very fibrous, and these fibers are extremely uh, durable and lightweight. So they've been used in cloth making, paper making, uh, and increasingly uh, combined with, with cement or various kinds of resins, they can be used to form uh, all kinds of building materials. Uh, which have really lightweight and strong properties. So that's that's the fiber use. Um, and then you have uh, the seeds, which are highly nutritious um, and rich in the omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid mix that a lot of uh, folks are looking for as a, a, a dietary supplement. And uh, these can be used you know, in many food products as well as cosmetics and so forth. And those are the main kinds of hemp uses. Uh, and then of course, it's the flowers of the, uh, of the plants that are uh, smoked as a recreational drug or from which uh, the psychoactive uh, cannabinoid molecule THC is, is extracted and, and ingested. And you know, this is one of the oldest cultivated plants. Um, we have archeological records going back, you know, 13,000 years. Uh, that, that show that humans uh, were working with this plant and using it in a variety of ways really early on in, in agriculture. And where, where in, in the world was, were these early uses? Well, um, there are uh, Egyptian tombs, for instance, uh, and records from, from the Middle East. There's archaeological evidence from ancient China. Pretty much every uh, major ancient civilization, except for those in the Americas, uh, had and used hemp. And that's, uh, that's because uh, hemp originated in the old world and was brought to the new world by European colonists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in fact, the uh, uh, founding fathers were hemp farmers in the United States. <laughs> that's right. It used to be quite... Uh... It used to be quite an, a profitable industry in the early Americas, right? Well, I, you know, I couldn't really speak to how profitable it was, but it was certainly a, a useful crop that um, was 
widely cultivated uh, in um, uh, particularly where I'm from in Minnesota in the upper Midwest. Um, probably the most recent uh, uh, hemp agriculture we had was during World War II when uh, the Department of the Army uh, built hemp mills and distributed hemp seed to uh, Minnesota farmers who grew it as a source of fiber for the war effort, making canvas and, and, uh, and cordage and this sort of thing. Yeah. A lot of what we have uh, now growing wild in Minnesota is uh, descended from that hemp that was grown during the Second World War. And just recently we've started to, to look into that and try to understand what's happened to the plant genetically since it escaped from cultivation and, and became a ditch weed. Uh-huh. Um, and what have, you, what have you found so far about how it's evolved since the mid 20th century? Well, one of the things, you know, when plants uh, escape from an agricultural setting, and this is an annual plant, you know, that dies every year and, new, and seed comes up again. So it's been through uh, many generations of natural selection adapting to the environment. And uh, so one of the things we've discovered uh, is that although industrial hemp germinate, the seed germinates readily, uh, in our cold climate here in Minnesota, this, uh, this um, uh, escaped cannabis, now we have a very difficult time germinating the seed because it, it requires uh, uh, cold and uh, that's, you know, it's adapted to survive our harsh winters because this seed falls to the ground in October and if we have a mild December, they could germinate. So we've had selection going on and now we're finding that uh, these, these wild uh, cannabis populations, when we bring them into the lab uh, and, try to, and try to germinate the seed, uh, we, have, we have real difficulty. They need to go through a cold treatment. So they become cold tolerant cold hardy or cold adapted. Right. And um, so the big difference between marijuana or one of the big differences between marijuana and industrial hemp, as you mentioned, is the drug content. And that really comes down to THC content. And last year you published a paper in the new Phytologist with some surprising results about the underlying genetics of THC, uh, THC's absence or near absence in industrial hemp. So tell us about those results. So, uh, you know, what my lab started working on about 15 years ago was the genetic basis of the difference between hemp and marijuana in terms of their uh, cannabinoid content, their drug content. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we basically, we conducted an experiment where we took a hemp strain uh, from, from Canada and a drug strain from, from the Netherlands. We imported those uh, under a DEA permit to a, a controlled, secure uh, lab facility where we grew these plants up and we, we crossed them to make a hybrid of the two. And then we took that, we took that hybrid and, and uh, uh, produced seed from it and then grew those seeds up to look. You dropped out right Basically, just as you were starting to talk about the new phytologist results. Oh, uh, okay. So you might want to so just kind of start at the, the beginning. The paper yeah. We, yeah, the paper we published in 2015. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this was an experiment where we crossed hemp with marijuana and uh, grew up this hybrid. And then we uh, took the seed from that hybrid and grew those grandchildren up to look at the variation in, in the uh, drug profile. Uh, of this hemp and marijuana cross, and um, that then enabled us to uh, dig deeper into uh, the genes that we think are responsible for producing THC, and in the one particular gene that that uh, does the final biochemical step to take THC from its um, from its uh, building block precursor molecule and turn it into the final drug. Um, we found that gene was not the one actually responsible for the, for the difference, but rather a related gene that uh, is responsible for um, a different part of this biochemical assembly line. That, and in fact, it produces a different cannabinoid called CBD or cannabidiol. 
And cannabidiol is the second most abundant cannabinoid in, um, in cannabis plants. And it turns out they share the same precursor. And so what our study showed was that it's not the gene for THC that makes a marijuana plant have more THC than a hemp plant. But in fact, it's a mutation in the CBD uh, enzyme, the gene for the CBD enzyme. This mutation knocks out this competing enzyme so that cannabis plants preferent, they, they, they now they make only THC, when in fact uh, the enzyme for CBD in uh, the hemp plants we've looked at is it's a superior competitor. So this is a case of not uh, of 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 the, the winner of this of this of this race um, does does so because the competitor gets knocked out before reaching the end of the finish line, and that's how we end up with uh, plants that have a lot of THC. All you know, one of the common myths is that uh, hemp plants don't have any THC. That's not true. They actually they have some THC. They just don't have enough THC uh, to to get anybody high. That's the main difference. And in fact, uh -huh. um, the marijuana plants, they also have CBD too. And so is one more uh, likely to occur in the wild than the other? Out of curiosity. Um, yeah, I mean, well, it depends on what, you know, what geographic area you're in. Uh, here in the upper Midwest, uh, the plants that we've studied that are feral escaped, you know, growing uh, in ditches and, and roadsides are of the, um, they're of the hemp type in terms of their cannabinoid profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But other places most part. than, than marijuana the most part. can also grow wild. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So, you know, if in Afghanistan, for instance, or the mountains of Morocco, uh, the plants that are that have escaped there are, are of the drug type, uh -huh. and uh, um, I, I I I can't uh, I can't prove it, but I, I would speculate that this might be true in some of the areas you know in Mexico or California where there's been a lot of illicit um, marijuana cultivation. Right. Yeah, and I would imagine. Um... It's, well, I think it's also interesting that, you know, the, the gene that everybody had put so much attention on was, was actually not, not the most important, ultimately, that it took a lot more genetic research and a focus on hemp, ultimately, to uh, uncover some of that research. Yeah, you know, and it's just kind of an interesting uh, part of science that, you know, you, you have a strongly held um, assumptions and... You do the experiments and you find that the results don't meet your expectations and you have to keep looking. And uh, I think that's something that a lot of folks don't necessarily appreciate about science. They tend to think of it as, you know, this is a textbook. We already know, you know, some of our, um, you know, some of our deeply held uh, ideas turn out not to be correct. And, you know, we had a difficult time uh, persuading our, our peers who had, you know, had to review this paper uh, that that we had that, that we had an answer that we had an answer we had an alternative explanation and um, you know we struggle with that all the time in our in our work um, yeah. you just never know how it's going to turn out so what was like the first result that you got back that was kind of just a head scratcher where you were like you had thought that you were going to get this really straightforward answer about the genes underlying THC and then and then you got something wonky yeah well um, the, you know, the, the, the work that we did, uh, the simple experiment, which is a lot like, uh, what that Czech monk Gregor Mendel did crossing his peas to discover the simple laws of inheritance. Right. Um, you know, we, we found a very simple pattern of inheritance when we looked at, uh, THC, we found that basically there's three, three basic chemical classes, high THC plants. Uh, high CBD plants and intermediate plants that have an intermediate level of, of uh, intermediate ratio of THC and CBD. And in our population, they fell into uh, a neat ratio of one to two to one. 
where you know uh, for, for every one high THC plant and every one high CBD plant there are on average two of these intermediate plants and that that um, that suggests a single gene with two different variants um, either for high THC or high CBD and your intermediate plants because these they have two chrome you know every plant's got two chromosomes you got one copy of each of those genes and that was the simplest explanation. But when we looked at the THC gene that we thought would be the candidate for that, it, it turned out that they all shared the same copy of the gene, and so that couldn't be it. Um, yeah. Now, we, we found that the CBD gene is really closely linked to that THC gene. They probably arose through an ancient evolutionary duplication that goes back um, long before... Um, humans ever interacted with this plant. I mean, closest so relative of... When it's like, uh, you know, when one gene is copied and then by mistake it's duplicated on the same chromosome, right? Right, yeah. So you get these, you get these uh, duplications occurring, and if they stick around, sometimes these uh, different copies of the gene um, get hit with mutations. In the rare case where a mutation might serve some kind of new function, then that gene can kind of take off on its own and, and uh, a new kind of evolutionary trajectory. So um, this is a really common pattern in, in, um, in evolution to see uh, genes duplicated and then, take, and then uh, taking on new functions. A lot of people think, well, that is, that's sort of like uh, these genes become, they become increasingly uh, per, you know, they become perfected at carrying out different functions. What was really a surprise about our work, and it's still kind of a head-scratcher for a lot of people, is that it's actually knocking out a gene that has been, uh, that it, it, by knocking out this competing gene, uh, humans have selected for this drug-type cannabis. So we think that that mutation was out there, and, you know, a relatively recent you know, in the in the context of human history, um, these, this drug type cannabis, uh, humans have picked up on it and and have um, favored it, such that it is really you know very widespread now uh, and widely cultivated, because it's got this uh, it's got this mutation that knocks out uh, the enzyme that um, that produces the non euphoric cannabinoid. Uh -huh. The CBD. So we have a question yeah. That ties in really well from the audience from Christopher Grassa. And he says, do we know why the plant evolved to produce these compounds, THC and CBD? Which so, kind of ties in what, with what you're saying. Yeah. Here. Why? You know, why are these things there? You know, there are some who, um, who claim that, um, uh, that uh, we have these uh, neuroreceptors in our brains uh, so that uh, they're there so that uh, the good Lord uh, enabled us the, 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 the opportunity to get high and the plants provide this for us. Um, good Lord, the there, there, there are other, <laughs> there are other explanations. Um, and if you look at these, these chemicals, they're, um, they are part of a, a chemical class that the plant uh, doesn't need for its basic uh, function, its basic metabolism. Um, they're called secondary chemicals. And uh, there are so many in plants. So many of our drugs uh, comp and spices and things come from these secondary chemicals. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's a matter of speculation, but if you look at where they're located on the plant, they're on these, they're on these leafy structures that that enclose the, the developing seeds. And on those leafy structures are these tiny plant hairs that have, um, uh, they contain resin. And these resins are rich in these uh, terpenoids that give it a really stinky aroma, and also these cannabinoids. And if you think about a plant uh, protecting its seed um, uh, so that it can mature, uh, these, these uh, resinous hairs uh, can deter uh, insects that might uh, that might prey on the developing seed. 
they're sticky and they could be um, they could be unattractive to you know to insects. That's kind of the leading explanation for why they're there. They're especially concentrated yeah, around the developing sort of, seeds. They had some sort of defensive property. Yeah. And then from there, they could have been selected for after that by humans. Yeah, and there's so many examples of that uh, in plants. You know, um, you know, from cinnamon, which is a bark of a tree, uh, to cloves, which are the tiny flower buds um, uh, of another tree, and uh, these chemicals have, you know, they're they're deterrents to feeding. Uh, so let's see, I also want to ask you, so currently most hemp sold in the U S is not grown here. Uh, but that could change as more than half of our 50 states have passed legislation to make it easier to grow hemp domestically, although it still is somewhat difficult. Uh, what problems, um, well, what is the, the current state of the policy? Like, when can you and can't you grow it? What problems does this introduce for the Drug Enforcement Agency? And how might your research help with a solution? So, uh, the, you know, the challenge is that you, here you have um, the same species uh, that can produce what is um, a scheduled controlled substance uh, in federal law but also other forms of the plant that are really not um, a threat to health or safety. And this is a problem. Um, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 is written in such a way as to exclude the cultivation of cannabis in the, in the United States. Uh, 2014 Farm Bill introduced, uh, there, there's um, a law in the 2014 Farm Bill that opens up the door to uh, research on industrial hemp and cultivating industrial hemp uh, in states that have state laws uh, that uh, define hemp on a THC, on the basis of THC content and a low THC level. So since that law passed, it, things have things have opened up quite a bit, uh, but it's uh, it's still uh, technically uh, not uh, it's still not legal to transport hemp across state lines, hemp plants across state lines, or viable seed across state lines. That's a real problem for a, a young industry. Uh, yeah. Now hemp products, on the other hand, um, and I have several to show you. Uh, there's no, no problem with those. We have clear, uh, clear legal uh, uh, basis for uh, permitting the, the um, production of hemp uh, materials and use of hemp. Uh, it's the cultivation yeah, that's, that's, that's the issue. So you know, what are some of the things uh, we've got here? Uh, this is a, a, a hemp in soap in liquid form. We've got a hemp uh, hand. This is hand soap. Uh -huh. We have, uh, that's of course extracted from the seeds. So you got cosmetics being used there. We've got, um, these are uh, toasted salted hemp seeds, kind of, kind of crunchy, kind of like uh, sunflower seeds, except you can eat the shells. The I hemp hearts. Know, I don't know whether hemp actually sounds delicious to me. Well, this 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 stuff has a really nutty flavor. It's uh -huh. um it's it's very tasty. Um, we just made some almond. Uh, these are hulled hemp seeds. They've had the shells taken off, and we made okay. some almond uh, hulled hemp seed cookies that um, that were really really tasty. Folks add this to their yogurt or their breakfast cereal or. It's good, you know, it's, uh, folks sprinkle it over um, uh, grilled meats and things, put it in salads, all kinds of uses. Uh, what else? Uh, we have some of the fiber products. Here's a, this is a um, hemp, uh, uh, just hemp cloth, very durable, um, lasts forever. And then um, increasingly popular are these hemp cotton uh, blends, which are quite soft. But last much longer than 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 uh, than uh, 
than than regular cotton. And these are these are hemp underwear. Uh, I think this is the first uh, live interview I've done where somebody pulled out a pair of underwear to show. I'm so sorry <laughs> if that. Uh, I'm so sorry if, if if I've embarrassed Sigma's eye. That was certainly not my intent. No, I think people are going to love it. Um, and so so hemp as a fabric as a fiber is especially durable and also soft. Why do people, why would you use hemp fabric versus? Hemp? Yeah, it's not particularly soft uh, compared to cotton, uh, but when blended with cotton, uh, it softens up a lot. It, it The fibers are, are um, hundreds of times longer than cotton fibers. So that, that lends to the durability. Uh -huh. And um, because they're so strong, um, they, they, um, and lightweight, they can be um, melded with cement and resins and things to produce uh, really innovative uh, kinds of building materials. So that uh, hempcrete is something uh, people are interested in. But at the present time, most of the domestic market in the U.S. is really focused on um, the uh, on the the seed and the seed oil for the edible and for the food and cosmetics. That's where. Um, I think it's $600 million a year now in um, in the domestic market, which is still small relative to a lot of um, commodity crops, but is um, it's growing every year. Uh, there's a lot of interest among folks who are interested in healthy and sustainable alternatives. And so... Yeah. Uh so this, there's this problem for the drug enforcement agency of, of this very useful, potentially profitable, profitable crop that looks just very much like a crop that they have to monitor uh, and, uh, and try to keep out of at least places where it's being grown illegally. Um, how might your research help with, uh, with that problem? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we got genetic testing now that uh, if there's if there's a question about whether uh, a plant is um, is likely to produce THC in a quantity that exceeds the the um, legal thresholds, uh, we can test for that. Uh, so that's that's a potential application. I think you know in the bigger picture, it's just bringing some clarity and some objectivity to, um, you know, a, um, a uh, you know, economically important plant that is um, just widely misunderstood. People have such uh, strongly held opinions about it, uh, for good or bad, that lack, um, lack evidence to, to support their positions. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, you know, they're, they're, you know, hemp products are not going to get you, uh, are, are, are not going to get, have the kind of psychoactivity that, that, um, is, um, is a, you know, is a risk to, uh, to health and safety. And I'm sorry, medical marijuana is not as safe as many people think it is. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of, a lot of, um, confusion out there on that issue. And I think people yeah. just, you know, um, I think society, you know, can benefit from just some evidence-based um, considerations, you know, because the plant is not going away. Um, right. Been here for a long time. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's deeply intertwined with our history and uh, we're, um, um, you know, it's, uh, um, it's got so much potential uh, if, uh, if only we could uh, we could align, you know, public policy with what makes sense in terms of um, medicine, in terms of um, uh, agriculture and uh, uh, and food. Mm -hmm. So let's unpack that a little bit more because um, the first thing I did when I started researching for this story was Google industrial hemp and cannabis. And of course, that turned up a big mixture of websites uh, and a lot of misinformation. Uh, and so what are some of the common myths that you see and hear most often? And, and what do you say to dispel them? Um, well, that's a yeah, it's a great, great question. And actually, um, one of the 
uh, very recent developments that has really complicated my life and telling the story of, 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 of hemp is the fact that um, in just a few years ago, uh, some marijuana breeders in Colorado uh, introduced a new, a new type of cannabis which uh, contains a lot of the CBD molecule I was just talking about and not so much THC. It's sort of like taking everything that a marijuana plant is and, um, and just swapping out CBD for THC. And these high CBD strains of cannabis um, have attracted a lot of attention because it turns out uh, for, uh, for some individuals, they, um, this high CBD doses appear to have uh, some, ver some very uh, strong health benefits. And it got, it got the most attention uh, in the case of, of rare uh, seizure disorders and uh, one called uh, Dravet syndrome, where young children suffering hundreds of, of seizures a day uh, don't live very long because they just can't function. Uh, and um, um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of parents seeking alternative therapy stumbled upon these high CBD strains and found that uh, symptoms just miraculously um, 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 you know, dissipated. I'm going to close my shade here. It looks like the sun is yeah, glinting yeah. off the like camera. The Afternoon here. Hopefully that's a little better. Yeah, uh, so, so now you have people marketing this high CBD oil, calling it hemp oil. You know, when we have when we have hemp seed oil, which doesn't have cannabinoids in it, it's it's all uh, fat. You know, it's fatty acids. So, um, and people are are marketing this and moving it around um, as though it's hemp, and and that that muddles definitions even more because now we have um, you know CBD being used as medicine and sold as hemp when we've been. Uh, when we've been saying hemp is not a drug for uh, for so long, so that's that's a difficult one to disentangle uh, right now. Uh, what are you know what are some of the um, you know what are some of the other myths uh, that um, hemp plants can uh, spontaneously become drug producing? Um, I haven't seen any evidence for that. Uh, that um, uh, that uh, uh, cannabinoids are are uh, safe. Um, certainly safer than many other drugs. Arguably safer than alcohol uh, or tobacco. Uh, but there are significant issues um, with with uh, what? cannabis what are some use. What risks that you that you have seen in the literature? Well, um, I mean, I'm not a physician by any means, but just looking at, at some of the information that's out there, you know, in, in, um, uh, in psychiatry and so forth, there, there are correlations between um, cannabis use and, and some forms of mental illness. And whether, where the cause and effect lies isn't clear, but, um, you know, folks... Um, Folks with uh, schizophrenia uh, tend to exhibit more uh, symptoms when they're using cannabis than not. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a correlation of um, folks who, kids who use cannabis early uh, may express a higher incidence of schizophrenia. Now, is that because they had certain behaviors, you know, a, they're just associating, you know, just doing risky behavior or choosing to do this, and it's not the cannabis that's driving it. We don't know, uh, but this is one of the things that I think, uh, with you know, recent interest, especially with in medical cannabis, um, mm -hmm. more studies are being funded now to look not just at um, uh, the uh, potential uh, risks, but also uh, benefits. 
So uh, I think there's there's a lot more to be learned about that, but that's not really the focus of my research. I'm you know I'm a botanist. I'm interested in the plant and how it does what it does. Yeah. So let's let's talk about how you got into that. You you started out as one of the first researchers in the U.S. permitted to study and legally grow cannabis, and uh, and how did you get into studying cannabis and uh, originally and and getting that privilege? Yeah, um, it's uh, it, well, it's it's a it's a kind of a funny story. Uh, I had, you know, for my PhD research, I had studied a related group of plants, the the figs, fig trees, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't, it the the the, How are they the ancestry that they share wouldn't be obvious, um, but in fact, um, hemp, hops. Figs, mulberries, uh, stinging nettles, uh, these are all plants that are part of a big uh, lineage that I've been studying now um, since my, my graduate days. And uh, at the time that I was uh, hired as an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, uh, back in 2001, we had uh, a, a populist governor named Jesse Ventura. Uh, professional wrestler, uh, who among his um, uh, many uh, popular positions was um, uh, a call to uh, look into uh, what the problems are associated with industrial hemp. Why can't we grow industrial hemp in Minnesota where we did back in World War II and now our neighbors to the north um, in Manitoba and Saskatchewan are growing it and we're buying it from them. Uh -huh. So uh, there was there was a call uh, to you know for, for you know to take this up and and at the time um, I got you know nothing but ridicule from uh, many quarters about you know the the professor of pot and why are you doing this and you know can't you study some what, other plant what, year, what, what decade or what year this is two thousand one okay yeah two thousand one a lot has changed since then. Now there, you know, there are hundreds of researchers who are suddenly interested in cannabis, and by some miracle, or perhaps just um, a lot of patience and persistence, I went through the the process, the formal process of getting uh, a research registration from DEA to study a Schedule One controlled substance, which is the most restrictive class of controlled substances you can study, and we had to develop these protocols that are so tight to prevent any kind of diversion of material, you know, out of the lab, or, you know, out of the growth facility and document, make sure we've destroyed everything at the end of these experiments. And uh, it's quite an interesting process, you know, to, to go through that. And at first you might think, well, it's, that's, that's ridiculous. This stuff is harmless. What's the big deal? But given the, the interest in the topic and some of the folks who who stalked us and you know shown a lot of interest in the project, I'm I'm much more comfortable at uh, you know sleeping at night knowing that we have this secure and and permitted way of working with this. Um, yeah. But it puts me in a very different place compared to many of the folks who handle cannabis on a daily basis. Uh -huh. Which which reminds me, I I have a prop here. Um, can you see that? Not yet. At least yet. I can't. Oh, yeah. here we go. Gotta go further. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, this is a this is a plant from our um, um, from our one of our growth chambers. It's it's a uh, uh, descended from uh, Minnesota uh, feral hemp that uh, we um, uh, collected uh, in the uh, in the field uh, this fall. Nice. And uh, and so. It, how long? So you collected it, and it's so it's germinated fairly recently. It's just a couple months old. Yeah. Oh, it's just a few uh, weeks old. Yeah. Just a few weeks old. Yeah. And then, um, how long will you grow it, and what will what will you study on it or harvest from it? Yeah. So what will happen to this plant now? Um, right now, we are growing it under 18 hours of daylight, and we'll do that for a number of weeks, and then we'll cut back. Uh, the day length because cannabis is a what's called a, a short day plant. As the days get shorter, it triggers flowering. So uh, once this plant flowers, 
uh, we will um, will cross it with other plants uh, that are descended from this same population. We'll take the pollen from a male plant and, and dust it onto the flowers of a female plant to produce some seed. Uh, we'll also uh, we'll allow that, uh, that uh, seed to mature and collect it. Then um, we'll take just a tiny pinch of a leaf and extract DNA from it. Mm -hmm. We will take some of the flowers and uh, harvest them and dry them and send them to another lab where they will uh, they will measure the quantity of the cannabinoids, so we'll know how much THC and how much CBD is in the plant, and we'll compare those results with um, the genetic test that we have. And what we're trying to do is, is validate that this, uh, this genetic test we've got uh, actually um, will work in more than just the plants that we um, uh, included in our original experiment. So it's, it's ongoing work. We also have a question from the audience. Uh, this is from Diane Timblin. She says, if I remember correctly, hemp was used for numerous practical purposes in colonial America. Were there any that might surprise us or mm. any beyond the expected like textiles that might be good to consider reintroducing? Yeah, um, that's, um, that's a great question. I think some of the, the a couple of examples, one, um, Thomas Jefferson in his garden book has this little note in which he, uh, he says, uh, 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 it is, uh, it's, it's uh, more, more desirable that we get underway with our cultivation of hemp. I find it uh, much more valuable than, than tobacco. And the more of it we lay aside, the happier I'll be, or something like that, uh, which is quite a, quite a funny quote. Uh, yeah. Then, but you know some of the some of the surprising uses which are not so funny. Um, one worth mentioning, I think, is little known fact that the strength of hemp row um, was such that uh, it was used in uh, in hanging, and uh, you wow. in, in by law hanging, hanging. Or, yes, or... yeah, yeah, and that's a dark that's a dark uh, part of hemp's history in that uh, laws, in fact. Uh, because of the the potential for a rope to, a rope to break, um, uh, law has stated that it had to be hemp rope. Um, wow. That's that's a dark uh, that's a dark fact. Um, uh, but the you know the other uses you know in those day you know in, in the in colonial America it was really about uh, the the textiles and the paper. Um, you know, the widely touted uh, example of the Declaration of Independence being written on hemp paper. Um, and um, I think those are, you know, those are um, important hemp facts. The, it's the seed that has really uh, exploded in recent years as a really surprising, useful, um, useful thing in terms of uh, the, the, um, the oil as uh, cosmetic and food. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question from the audience from Sherry Parr. Uh, she asks, and I'm not sure whether you can exactly answer this one because you're not a physician, but she, she but we'll, we'll give it a shot anyway. Uh, she says, physicians recommend CBD oil for cancer patients. Is there a significant difference between the oil from hemp versus the marijuana plant? And, and there would be, right? Yeah. There, yes, and and um, this is a this is a great question and gets back to that complicated issue I was talking about uh, uh, moments ago, where right. the CBD oil is um, now uh, getting a lot of attention. Suddenly, and, and it's being called hemp oil, correct? Some sometimes it's being called hemp oil. Uh, the uh, the issue for me there is confusing it with the oil that is extracted from the seeds when they're pressed, which doesn't have CBD in it. Um, and is used for a lot of cosmetics. And used things. for a lot of things, and it, yeah, and is not used as medicine. Uh, but CBD oil right now, I guess you'd call it one of these nutraceuticals, one of these unre unregulated it's not FDA approved or FDA regulated. It, you know, it's just this. It's in this gray area right now, and um, it can be extracted from hemp plants. 
But honestly, um, most of what is on the what is being sold as CBD oil is probably derived from these hemp marijuana hybrids that have been selected for producing lots and lots of of uh, of of the uh, cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. So you know your typical commercial hemp strain. If you measure the drug content or the cannabinoid content, it'll be one to two percent of the of the dry weight of the plant. But these drug types um, now, thanks to you know breeding, mm -hmm. uh, percent dry weight twenty to thirty percent dry weight in in uh, cannabinoids. And depending on which genes you have, you can either you can either be producing mostly THC or mostly CBD or or an intermediate of each. So um, it's, it, it gets tricky when we talk about um, hemp and marijuana. I don't think um, the, the plants that produce 20 to 30 percent CBD can fairly be called hemp plants. Mm. There's something else and I don't think we have a name for them yet. Um, mm. But it's a, it's a very good question. Um, you know, and uh, um, you know, I won't speak to the to the um, um, to the, the the farm. You know, to the uh, what physicians are recommending and and cancer and so forth. Uh, but I can say that um, um, the way that the these cannabinoids interact with our with our nervous systems is dramatically different between THC and CBD, and it takes very little THC to produce dramatic effects. But for CBD, because of the way it interacts with the body, it takes a lot of CBD to, uh, to see effects. And so that has driven up the demand for this because on a, on a um, quantity basis, people are taking thousands of times more CBD than they would take in the form of THC to achieve some effect. Um, and, and whether it's uh, whether, you know, the cancer, that's very controversial. Um, certainly the experiments... Um, uh, in uh, in vitro, you know, the experiments on the petri plates. Clearly, you can inhibit the growth of cancer cells with CBD. That's that's that is established. Um, but many chemicals do that, and on a petri plate. But when it comes to the human body, it's a different story. And is the quantity that 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 someone could ingest even comparable to the you know the to the effect that you get on a petri plate, we don't know. But I know that uh, NIH, National Institutes of Health, has recently supported studies that are looking into all of this um, in um, a clinical setting. So the science, so the science will be more settled in the in the nearish future. Well, I mean, this, the science is never settled, but I think we're going to learn something. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully, that's a, okay. hopefully soon. The sooner the better. <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit more about how your research has changed, uh, especially in 2015, then your home state of Minnesota passed the Industrial Hemp Act, making it legal to grow hemp there, at least for research, right? Uh, and so how has that changed your research? Yeah. Being able um, to grow it there? So, you know, prior to um, a state law for industrial hemp research, uh, we uh, were working so only within the protocols that uh, we were able to approve through, through DEA, which limit the sources of material to what we can import from abroad mm -hmm. or acquire from other registered uh, cannabis labs. And so, you know, when I first started studying the subject, there were very few registered cannabis labs from which I could, you know, get material. Um, we had to import from abroad. That was extremely difficult because you got to get permits from both countries and, and work through all of that. Uh, so we were, we've been very limited in terms of what material we could work on. Uh, you know, if, if I had a dollar for every person who's volunteered to provide us with material, uh, I wouldn't be writing research grants, <laughs> but, but uh, I, we can't take that, of course, you know, because we're, we're, you know, we're, I'm at a research university and, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, we, we comply with regulations that govern research. That's just what we do. So, um,
Oh no, I think we might have lost you again. Well, you had just about finished that answer to your question about how your research had changed um, after Minnesota made it legal to grow uh, hemp in your home state, making it a lot easier for you to get new seeds and try new new breeding programs, right? Yeah, so um, you know now we're we're going to use the um, the wild populations that we've sampled to to try to confirm the results we published previously, and you know ultimately the hope is that uh, we might be able to uh, develop some useful hemp genetics uh, from uh, these these old. Um, uh, these these old populations that are descended from uh, from the American hemp that was um, um, probably uh, bred in in Kentucky way back, but that was um, the place those where it was grown a lot in early, right? Sorry, Kentucky was a place where there was a lot of a, a big hemp industry in early in earlier. In yes. The yes. Yes. Also, and while I'm I think, saying something, I still can't see you. Uh, you might need oh. to press a button to make us be able to see uh, you. Yes. There <laughs> we go. Okay. There you go. Hey, so. <laughs> um, yeah. So the uh, a lot of the a lot of the hemp that was distributed during the war effort was um, the seed was was developed in Kentucky. Okay. Uh, but. <laughs> There is no there is no seed bank for that material because of um, uh, you know cannabis being regarded as a drug. Uh, seed collections have been you know were purged. Material was destroyed. We don't actually have that a lot of that material to go back to uh, from American hemp. Only what exists in a few um, seed bank repositories around the world have a few things. So we're, we're hoping we can learn something interesting from, from these wild populations, maybe find something useful. And I imagine some people have done some uh, evolutionary tree kind of work on some of these, um, these uh, hemp crops and hemp strain. Yeah, uh, there, there are a number of, of folks who are working on trying to unravel the, the history of domestication. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it's complicated. Uh, it's complicated because there, the plant, it's just one species. You can interbreed any cannabis plant with any other cannabis plant, and it's so widely cultivated. It's going to be a hard story to unravel for that reason. The, the closest yeah. relative we have is hops. You know, the flowers of hops, vines are used in beer making. Um, I don't think there's any coincidence there, actually, because uh, hops also have some psychoactive effects. Uh, but the, the hops and the, and the cannabis plant, I mean, they diverged tens of millions of years ago. I mean, we've, we've worked on you know, using DNA to estimate um, the, um, how deep that family tree goes back. Mm -hmm. And there's fossil evidence also. And, uh, it, you know, it's really hard because unlike a lot of our cultivated plants that have sort of wild relatives in some part of the world that were pretty confident there's their wild populations were wild, wild relatives um, cannabis we've been tangled up with it for so long um, in our history that it's it just seems like a lot of that uh, uh, history may have may have been maybe obscured uh, and, and we'll see what comes out of all the uh, the genetic work that folks are doing who are tackling this using uh, the new really high throughput DNA sequencing that can deliver uh, a genome at lightning speed. Mm -hmm. That sounds, it sounds fascinating. Um, so we've got to close pretty soon, but I just want to uh, end by asking you if there's, what, what are kind of the, the major um, research directions you're going in now on uh, studying hemp, uh, its genetics, and and how to breed or engineer new varieties that are more viable as a domestic crop? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, the uh, the engineering, you mentioned engineering, and of course that, and since we're doing genetics, that always raises the question about genetic engineering, and, mm -hmm. 
And I should say um, that uh, uh, for the audience, uh, we in, we initially proposed some some work in which we would we would do some use some biotechnology uh, to, to potentially produce new cannabis varieties. But I learned very quickly from the from the industry the, from the hemp industry that um, it has a very strong uh, anti GMO position. I'm sure. And uh, and so um, we're uh, sen we're sensitive to that and respectful of that and. Um, are currently pursuing uh, conventional approaches to breeding rather than transgenic cannabis, which um, that's a question. And um, there are folks who are working on that. I'm not one of them. Uh, but the direction we're taking next is to continue studying the, the, the crossed population that we have to further understand how hemp and drug type cannabis are different. We're pursuing that. We're also uh, gearing up for uh, an agricultural or an agronomic field trial where um, in collaboration with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, we're planning to uh, plant out about 12 different commercial varieties of hemp and see how they perform at sites in Minnesota. And this is similar to work that's going on in North Dakota and Kentucky and Colorado and other states. Uh, we want to see how it does here in Minnesota. And then hopefully select some of the most successful crop varieties of industrial hemp. Yeah, and at least uh, I think there's, you know, there's great interest here in, uh, in uh, developing certified seed that, you know, Minnesota farmers could produce that would go through a certification process to supply um, a, a, a market should we reach that point when uh, domestic, uh, you know, domestic hemp production and demand are, are matched up. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we are probably growing closer to that day, certainly a lot faster than I ever expected. Uh, uh -huh. When I started doing this uh, project 15 years ago, I never could have imagined uh, what people would be doing and what we'd be talking about in, in 2016. It's just um, kind of a, a really dramatic uh evolution and turn of events. And so there's sort of this sense of excitement in the field that the, that industrial hemp is kind of poised uh, as a potential domestic industry. Yeah, I, I mean, the conferences that are bringing people together to talk about this, people coming from so many different sectors um, to think about it and talk about it uh, is, is very exciting and I'm, I'm really uh, you know, kind of honored to be a part of that conversation. So thanks for having me on the webinar. Yeah, thank you. And uh, good luck with the research. I hope you keep us posted. Will do. All right. Thank you, Kate. Take care, George. Thank you so much. Bye now.